So previously, when talking about the primitive data types, I mentioned how eventually we'll be able to build our own data types based off of those primitives. And the way that you go about accomplishing this in Python is through classes and objects. So fundamentally speaking, a class is basically a blueprint of some new type of data. And then an object is a specific instantiation of that data. So kind of the classic example of this is that a class could be an example of a blueprint for a phone. And then an object is the specific implementation of a phone. So this could be either some Apple phone, a Samsung, a Blackberry, the kind of variations and specific data asserted to each object can differ. However, each of those objects is still fundamentally the same class. It's they're still all phones. So within Python, the syntax for defining a class is you firstly best use the class keyword, followed by the name of your class, followed by the colon, and then indented, you can then specify several different functions. And the first function, which almost all the classes you'll write will contain, is the underscore underscore init underscore underscore function. And this is a function which is called whenever an object of the class is created. So whenever a phone, a specific phone is made. And this function simply serves to initialize the state of the object. And so this can be doing any internal computations or setting the initial state of any variables. And within all functions of a class of Python, a special variable called self is passed. And self basically is just a reference to the specific object so that the class blueprint knows which object it's working with. And so, for example, in this example, whenever my class is initialized, a inner variable, the self dot variable, is initialized to be contain a value of 10. And additionally, we have a specific function defined, which then simply prints the variable contained in the object self. So practically then, if we have this prior uh, class definition, to create an object, we simply call the class similarly to how we would call a function. We can then call the class's function by writing the variable we can then call the class's functions by simply writing the name of our object, followed by a period, followed by the name of the function. So after this, 10 will be outputted since when the function is called, it prints the object's variable, which in this initial function, which was called when the object was initialized, the variable was set to 10. Now we can also access class variables by writing the name of the object, followed by the period, followed by the name of the variable. So after this, x will contain the data of 10. Now it's also possible to create more complex classes by passing in parameters to the objects. So in a prior example, the class variable was simply set equal to 10. However, it's possible when initializing your, an object to pass in an argument and then to either set some initial state of the object to according to that argument or to do some additional computations. In this example, we simply set the self dot variable to be equal to the past argument. So now, when we create an object of my class, we have to pass in some argument to within the uh, parentheses. And so in this example, we pass in three. So then when this init function is called, the object reference self is passed in, as well as the argument we created, so three is passed in. As a result, the object's variable is set to three, Additionally, if we create a second object and pass in an argument of seven, 
then its variable will be equal to seven. And we can see this then when we call the object one's function, three is outputted. And when we call the object two's function, seven is outputted. So to showcase this example, let us define a new Python script. And in this example, we will create a new class called my class. So as mentioned, the first function which we can define is the initial function, the init function, which takes in the self parameter and some parameter x, which we will use to set the object's x variable. We can then have an additional function called get x, which simply returns the current object's x variable. So now what we can do is we can create an object, let's call this object simply y, by calling the my class function, give it passing it some parameter for the variable of x. In this case, let us pass three. If we then print the output of calling y's get x function, and we then save and run this script, we'll see that three is outputted. And that's because in this line, we instantiate an object of our class, passing in three as the variable for x, so the object's dot x is set to three. And then when we call get x, we return three. Now, let's say we wanted to create a second object though called z. And we wanted this to be just simply the exact same as y. So similarly to how if we have say x is equal to five, we can set y equal to x. We can also say in this case, z is equal to y. And then if in addition to printing out y's get x, if we print z's get x, we see that they both output three. Since z simply becomes a copy of y and so it has all the same attributes and so forth. However, if we define a function, for example, called set x, which takes in a new x parameter and sets the x parameter to that new value. And we then call set x on y, say changing the value to five. Well, if after this we print the value of y's get x, we'll see that firstly, y has a value of x, then z has a value, or, Pardon. y has a value of three, then z has a value of three, and after we set a new x value, y has a value of five. The interesting thing though, is that if we now print z's x value, you'll note that it is also five, despite the fact that we never changed z's value, we only changed y's value. And to understand why this is, we have to look at something called variable references. And so before, when we wrote x equals five, I said that this meant that pretty much x, the variable x is five. But in reality, this isn't exactly true. What really happens is x, the variable, is simply a box. And whatever data we set x equal to, we're really just putting that into the box of x. And so if we then change the value of x, if we say x then is equal to the string ah, all we're doing is putting some new piece of data into x's box. However, when we initialize an object of a class, we don't actually put the object in set itself inside the box. Instead, we kind of create this representation of the object which contains all of the objects' data. So in this case, our inner object's variable x is equal to three. And then the object underscore one variable itself simply contains a reference to the external object. 
Additionally, whenever we change the object's data, for example, by saying object underscore one dot x is equal to seven, this simply goes to the reference of object one. So this then goes to the object and changes what is in the x variables box. And furthermore, if we set the variable equal to a new object, what this does is it creates a new object representation and simply changes the reference contained in object one's box to the created object. And with Python, one thing which occurs is that then since this old object doesn't have anything referencing it, no variables are referencing this object anymore, it is automatically deleted by the Python language. So within Python then, whenever we set a variable equal to the value of another variable, really what we do is we copy whatever is contained in this box. So when we set y equal to x, we simply copy the data in x's box. So then we put five in y's box. With objects, however, we have to be really careful because remember, the variable doesn't contain the object itself, but simply a reference to the object. So if we set another variable equal to our original variable, since all we do is copy what is in the box, what ends up happening is we just copy the reference to the same object. And as a result, if we then change the object's data from within one variable, it modifies the same object that both variables are referencing. That's why if we then try to access the second variable's data, it will have also have been modified. So then whenever you want to actually copy an object within Python, you basically have to create an entirely new object and simply set the object's data correspondingly. You can't simply state that the, vari the new variable is equal to the old variable, else you'll be running into this error with variable referencing. Moving on though, now that we've seen how you can use classes and objects to create your own data types, we can move on to covering kind of more advanced data structures which are available within Python, namely lists and dictionaries. So a list is fundamentally a collection of different items, and it's represented within Python using these square brackets. And so this is, for example, a list containing the elements one, two, and three. And you can see that each element is separated by a comma. Now, one important thing to note within Python is that lists are zero indexed. So each of these elements has a corresponding index, which we use to access them. And so the first element is has an index of zero. The second element has an index of one and so forth and so forth. To access an element in a list, then we simply use the square brackets and put the index that we want to access at in the brackets. So this will output one since one is at the zero index of my list. And we can also access ranges of data by passing in indices with a colon. So this then accesses from the first index inclusively to the last index exclusively. And if this ends up being more than one element, then what ends up being returned is actuality a sublist of the original list. So since one is at index zero and three is at index two, and we want to return from index zero inclusively to two inclusively, what ends up being returned are the elements at indexes zero and one, or the elements of one and two. Now, in addition, we can also give a step so instead of an interval of one, we can also add a separate interval to when accessing from our list. So in this case, then we go from index zero inclusively to index three exclusively with a step of two. And so as a result, we return the data one and three. And finally, we can also use this sub 
listing and accessing different portions of a list to set new variables and new elements. Now, one thing to note is that if you try to access an index which doesn't have a corresponding element to it in the list, so for example, if we try to access the element at index three, well, since our list doesn't contain any elements at index three, this will actually throw an error and crash your program. So it's important to note how long your list is and from there, make sure you're not going to access any portions of the list which doesn't actually contain data. So besides simply accessing portions of your list, it's also possible to modify your list after you've initialized this. This is simply done by using the same kind of accessing syntax and then simply setting that element equal to a new um, element. It's also possible to add new data to the end of a list by calling the append function. So if you initialize some list to simply be called list, then you can simply call list.append and pass in the data you wish to add to the end, which will then be added to the list. If at any point in time you want to get the length of your list, for example, to make sure you're not going to access an index which isn't contained, you can use the len or the len command which will return the number of elements contained in your list. Now, it's important to note that because lists are indexed at zero, the maximum index is actually the length of it minus one. Now, an interesting thing within Python is that strings can actually be considered lists as well. So if we have the string hello contained in a variable x, this is actually partitioned within Python as a list of every single character. Since remember, when I introduce strings, there are basically simply sets of characters. And similarly to lists, all of these characters are indexed at zero. As a result, if you want to access substrings or characters from a string, you can do so in the same manner as a list. So accessing the first element of X will simply print the H character, since it's the zero indexed character in the string hello. Similarly, if you access the substring from zero to two, this will return HE. And if you can additionally use a step to access from zero to five with a step of three, additionally, you can use negative indices to access the last elements of a list. So negative one simply represents the last index, negative two, the second to last index, and so forth and so forth. And so this is a useful way to partition your string or your list without having to use the len command to figure out the length. And so accessing from the first index to the negative one index, since this is from the first inclusively to the negative first exclusively, we'll simply return ELL. Now, another feature of Python is that you can use for loops to iterate through lists. Now, firstly, another feature of lists is that they don't have to contain the same type of data. So in the examples prior, all of the lists contain integers or contain characters as strings, but lists can actually contain any different types of data within them. So then you can use a for loop. So instead of for i in range, you can use for element in the variable name of your list and then do some sort of code execution upon each element. So in this example, first seven will be outputted since it's the first element in the list, followed by negative 3.2, followed by the string dog. Now, besides lists, another data structure available within Python are dictionaries. So dictionaries are a set of key value pairs where each key uniquely maps to a specific value. And so a classic example of this is a phone book where the keys are names of people and the values are their phone numbers. And the syntax for defining a diction within Python is as follows. So the diction, all of the data is contained within curly brackets 
and you then have separated comma separated key value pairs with the key written first followed by a colon followed by the value and similarly to lists the keys and values can be of any corresponding type in this example they're all strings but you can use integers or floats or custom objects and so forth to access a element of a dictionary similarly to a list you use the open you use the closed brackets and pass in the key in order to access the value so that line of code will return the corresponding value to the key of john which is the following phone number now dictionaries can also be modified by accessing a key and setting a new value as well as a entirely new key can be introduced by simply passing it in as if it were already existed within the dictionary. If you want to delete a key value pair, that is accomplished using the del command or the del command, and then passing in and followed by the key accessed value pair. And finally, Dictionaries can also be iterated through using the dot items command. So the dot items command simply returns a list of lists of the key value pairs. So as a result, using the for looping structure, you can simply do a for every key value in the dictionary's items and then perform whatever computation or outputting you wish to do. And so for this example, we are simply converting all of the values which were num which were initially strings into integers. So in our last example, we can use Python to showcase the effectiveness of using lists and dictionaries. So firstly, one thing which is possible is to initialize an empty list. And an empty list is just simply any list which has no elements within it. And so that's simply the open and close parentheses with no elements written as a comma separated list. And the reason I'm initializing a list like this is so that say we wanted to initialize a list which contains all of the numbers, all of the odd numbers from say one to nine, all of the odd digits. Well, we can accomplish this by initializing an empty list and then using a for loop from the range of one inclusively to 11 exclusively with a step of two and simply appending the value of i at every iteration and you can see if we then print x after this loop is called we'll see that x contains one three five seven and nine so all of the odd digits then specific elements of x can be accessed using the indices so remember within python lists are zero in these lists are zero indexed so an index of zero corresponds to the first element additionally we can use negative indices to access the elements reversely so negative one returns nine as the last element negative two will return the second to last element which is seven and so forth and so forth Furthermore, the len command can be used to obtain the length or the number of elements contained within a list. So since there are five odd digits, the length of x is five. And finally, we can use the colon to access a sublist of x. So for example, if we want to know the first, the first three, pardon, the first three odd digits contained within x. So this accesses the elements from the index of zero to the index of three exclusively. So this will access the elements with indices of zero, one, and two, which are correspondingly one, three, and five. In addition to this, we can showcase the power of dictionaries by performing what may seem to be a difficult task. So say we wanted to return a count of every single characters within a given string. So say, so we can define a function to do this, so called count chars. 
which takes in some string s and which will return a dictionary of a, every character in s to its corresponding count. So we accomplish this by firstly initializing an empty dictionary, which similarly to how you can initialize an empty uh, list, this is accomplished by simply having the open and close brackets. And then remember, since strings can be iterated, can be treated similarly to lists, we can simply iterate through every character within the list. So for character in S, and we can then perform some sort of operation, some sort of function on every character. So to check whether a key is contained within a dictionary, you can use the in command. So we can check whether char is in the R dictionary of countings. And if char is not in the dictionary of counts, we will want to put it in. So if char is not contained within counts, we can set counts of char equal to one. Since we will know then that, you know, this character has not been encountered yet, and thus we know there is exactly one count of it. Else, we know it's safe to try to access the character. So we can say that the count of the character so far is equal to the current count plus one. After this has been executed for every single character, we can simply return our counts dictionary. And so if we then print the results of calling this function on, for example, ABC, you'll see that Pardon, that's simply a mistake in my spelling. So if we call this on ABC, you'll see that the return of the function will be a dictionary mapping every character contained in the string, so A and B and C, to their respective counts. So there's one A in the string, one B in the string, and one C in the string. And if we say add some more Cs and run this again, we'll see that correspondingly, we now have eight Cs. If we add in some additional characters and perhaps even multiple words within a string, we can run this again and we can now see that we have four A's, one B, eight C's, three Z's, five E's, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. And so from a very simple code snippet, we now already have a very powerful function which can then allow us to be used to determine the counts of any specific character. So for example, we can then call this dictionary to see, you know, what's the number of E's contained in this string. So we'll see that there are five E's. If we wonder about how many D's there are, we can correspondingly call via a different key and get the number of that key. So this is, you know, perhaps a more advanced usage of dictionaries, but it still showcases kind of the power of them and how you could use them in conjunction with iterative structures and Boolean logics, as well as functions to begin to build very powerful code.